else, I want to ask you, Mark, to start the recording. Thank you. Okay, well, this is Marilyn Scholl, and I want to welcome everyone to the uh, Food Co-op 500 and CDS Consulting Co-op webinar. Um, we are pleased to have you registered for, for today's call. We have, uh, well, let's see, it looks like we have over 80 people signed up today um, and representing at least 40 different groups from around the country. And today's webinar is part of a series sponsored by Cooperative Development Services, Food Co-op 500, and the CDS Consulting Co-op. If you are um, uh, seeing the, the, the slide on your screen, the, the website is there for you to get information uh, after the webinar. You can download a recording or uh, access the materials that have been presented or referred to today. Um, before we begin the webinar, uh, I'd like to ask Mark to give, uh, give you information about how you can participate in today's webinar. Great. Thanks, Marilyn. We're going to be using the standard uh, practice of using the GoToWebinar question and answer interface. And we welcome your uh, interactions, comments, questions. And also, just if you want to practice, you're welcome to do that as well. The little mini tutorial is to click the triangle next to the letter Q in the word question type in the little box and hit submit to staff and Stuart Reed and I will be managing your questions and pa be passing them along to Mel and then also at the end of the session um, there will be a, a, uh, an evaluation form that will come up on your screen and um, or if it doesn't it'll come to you via email I actually forget how this is set up um, and we certainly look forward to your, your comments about the session thanks Great. Thanks, Mark. I um, want to also let you know that one week from today at the same time, we'll have the next uh, webinar in this series. It will be the last one of the fall series. It will be Market Research, Projecting Sales Potential and Identifying Site Characteristics. Uh, Dave, Debbie Swasuna, uh, Market Research Analyst with uh, CDS Consulting Co-op, will be presenting that webinar. We hope you'll be able to attend. Uh, next, I'd like to introduce Stuart Reed, who's going to be assisting Mark with a question queue today and is the Food Co-op Development Specialist with Food Co-op 500. So, uh, Stuart, do you want to tell us just a little bit about your role in Food Co-op 500? Yes, hi. Um, I work with all of you startup groups out there. Whenever you contact me, I try to provide advice, referrals, and the best resources that are available to help you along the way. We use uh, the development model that was developed by the Co-op Development Services Group and try to provide a way to make your organizing as effective, efficient, and as quick as possible. And we hope that if you haven't already contacted us, that you will and that you will let us know what we're doing well and what we aren't. So we and we're really pleased to be here today with uh, CBS people uh, presenting these webinars. Great. Thanks, Stuart. And then next, I'd like to introduce Mel Braverman. Uh, Mel is a consultant with CDS Consulting Cooperative. He's been working with us since 1999. Prior to that, he was the, the general manager of both a retail food co-op, um, a wholesale food cooperative, and a, a, a privately owned natural food store. So Mel has a lot of experience in uh, planning and managing cooperatives, and we're very pleased to have him here with us today to share what he knows. So take it away, Mel. Thank you, Marilyn. Well, good morning, good afternoon. I don't think it's good evening. Nobody here is from Japan, I don't believe, on this call. Um, today we're going to talk about um, evaluating feasibility of a startup project and then planning for success. I I'd like to um, grab a couple of uh, uh, definitions and quotes here that I was uh, viewing because uh, I think they'll be helpful for all of us. Again, as we move along uh, throughout the course of this uh, webinar, any questions, please just type them in, and, and Stuart and Mark will uh, I will stop every so often, as often as possible, um, ask them for questions, and Stuart and Mark will feed them to me. Also, along the way, I will probably be asking Stuart, since Stuart is actually uh, not only uh, a development specialist, but also Stuart happens to have started a specific co-op in Minnesota, Just Foods Co-op. Uh, took it from uh, zero, ground zero to uh, fruition, 
And so I'll be asking him for his input into uh, some of the and insights into some of our issues that we'll be discussing. I'd like to start off with a uh, um, uh, definition: feasibility, feasibility, capable of being done, capable of being dealt with successfully. That's what feasibility is. It's the ability to deal with something successfully. Planning, the establishment of goals, policies, and procedures for a social or economic unit. And uh, I was going to use economic unit, but I realized that co-ops are both the social and economic unit. So again, you know, feasibility is, is capable of being done, and, and planning is establishing goals, policies, and procedures um, to accomplish what you want to get done. Then I, 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 everybody knows the quote, uh, he, who plans to, he who fails to plan, plans to fail. But I found another quote that I found pretty interesting, or, and I think it's very true. It's planning is bringing the future into the present so that you can do something about it now. I think that's a very insightful comment. Uh, many times we recognize that had we thought through a project or product or process earlier on, we might have avoided some of the problems that we've run into by not thinking through carefully. Having said that, no matter how carefully we think through, no matter how many minds we bring into the room, there will always be some unexpected things um, that will occur during the course of our um, work. Uh, the work that you folks are doing is very important work, and it's also uh, all volunteer work, to the best of my knowledge, at this point. Usually start a group, start with a, a group of well meaning, caring people who have uh, an idea. Uh, working together, they create a shared vision. And hopefully, that shared vision, if, if everything goes well, uh, can be brought to um, creating an actual physical entity that serves the community in a number of ways, both socially and economically, perhaps other ways that I'm not speaking of. We're going to walk through uh, a number of um, slides here. Uh, and and just talk about what what is what is feasibility you know how what what areas that we are looking at in terms of developing a store do we have to think about as are they feasible or are they not and then we also want to talk about planning how do we how do we make good solid plans so that we're successful in implementation this will be our agenda we'll just take a brief overview of the development model I know that you any of you who have been on a number of these calls have probably seen it but we won't spend a lot of time on it but it is it is the backbone it is the basis of everything that we're doing in all of these webinars we'll look at development timeline uh, and just as I'll say then but I'll say it again there there is no specific timeline it is not like today you get a group of people and we can say in eight months from now you'll be at point A and 12 months from now at point B. But there are some, there is some data that we have collected over time from startups and we're getting a feeling on how long does it take to successfully um, develop a project. We'll take a look at the feasibility components, that be market, financial, design, and organizational. Many times uh, we, we see that folks are very tuned into the market and financial feasibility components but aren't as quite as aware of the design or organizational feasibility components. And then we'll look at planning, organizational, financial, business planning, management plans, board development plans. And uh, at the end, we'll take a look at general guidelines for success. How are we so far? Any questions come up yet? <laughs> okay. So far, nothing, Mel. You're doing okay. a great job. So far, okay. Also, just uh, to, I don't know if Mark mentioned this, but if people are having problem hearing, or if I'm moving along too quickly or such, don't hesitate to write that in. I'm, I'm open to adjusting in midstream here. In front of us, we have here the Food Co-op 500 development model. And uh, this model is basically four cornerstones. If we look at that, it's division, talent, capital, and systems. Those are the, that's what we look at in each developmental stage, the three stages being organizing, feasibility and planning, and implementation. So within each one of those three stages, we always want to assess the four cornerstones. While we're organizing, we want to look at the four cornerstones, feasibility and planning and implementation, because in each stage, there is an important part that each of those cornerstones plays. And in each stage, a cornerstone may play a different part. At some points, uh, some cornerstones come up higher uh, on the list of needs and others fall to the background. But there is no stage where all four 
cornerstone should not be viewed and assessed and improved when needed. The three stages of development are organ organized feasibility and planning and implementation. And today we are speaking, we're going to focus our time and energy on feasibility and planning. Just to give you a sense of a timeline, a potential timeline for a project, um, we can look at organizing to be anywhere from 6 to 18 months. Feasibility can go for up to a year, planning for up to nine months, and sometimes beyond. And then you can look at the other, the other few um, areas, pre-construction and implementation. Now, in timelines, this is kind of how many months it might take to do these areas well. They will overlap at times. So it's not a matter of um, organizing for 18 months and then starting on feasibility and then starting on planning. Although we do like to have people really, um, really do well whatever stage, the first stage they're working on prior to moving on to the other next stages. But there is always typically some overlap in those. And again, we are looking at the feasibility and planning aspects which as you can see can take up to a year. And if you look at them both together, it might take uh, perhaps a little bit more than a year, even if you're feasible in some areas and beginning planning while you're still doing feasibility in other areas. Again, every, or every project uh, has its nuances. Every project is a little bit different. Um, some folks do things more quickly. Some things do things more slowly. Um, some communities are more ripe and ready to jump on and move ahead. Some communities need uh, a lot more organizing, and uh, so that slows down other parts of the process, but appropriately so. Excuse me. So there are feasibility components that we're going to look at. We're going to take a look at five main areas. Market feasibility. Um, are there enough sales in in our area to run a successful store. Location, is there, a, can we produce a store in a place that will meet the community's needs, that will be whatever the needs are, access we certainly always want, um, visibility, um, is it big enough or is it small enough, all the, can, can we get in and out, is it on the way to work, all those different aspects of location of which I think uh, Debbie next week will probably talk a lot more in detail. Uh, financial feasibility. Um, do, we, do we have, can we bring in the funds and can the store be self-sustaining after a, a specific amount of time? Design feasibility. Um, can we produce a store that will optimize our sales potential, that will allow us to achieve the sales potential that we want to put into our financial plan? Organizational capacity. This is the we folks, the, the people. Um, do we have uh, the right people? Do we have the right skill sets? Um, are we going to need to bring in people from elsewhere to help us? Because this is, as you can see, there's a lot of uh, technical and also just a lot of work to be done, and I'm sure you all are very aware of this, in starting a food co-op. And organizational capacity at times um, is strained if it is left to a few people to champion the project from start to finish. The more people that participate and put their energy in, um, typically the better organizational capacity is. We'll get into a little more specifics. Questions about any of this? So far, we do not have any. All right. Well, you know, I, what I'll do is I'll ask, and if I don't hear you in a couple seconds, I'll just move on, and you'll stop me if by chance you would just slow on the draw there. All right. You'll have to excuse this one slide. It's the one slide I could not make just appear together, but here we are. So we're looking at market feasibility. As I said, we want to look at are there enough potential sales in this trade area? Now, trade area is a somewhat technical term that, uh, you know, that I was not familiar with when I was uh, first working. I thought, well, my community. I looked in the community I lived in and, and would think, well, I, there's a lot of people in this community. What we learn over time and what we learn and what Debbie, I think, Debbie Swasuna next week might uh, touch upon, is that the trade area is very different than necessarily than your community. 
there are specific technical boundaries that at times impact trade areas that I, as a person who doesn't do that work, would have no idea. So it's real important to uh, take a look at it and, and have somebody who knows what the trade area would be to help define it for any group. It might be market feasibility might be an appropriate time to have what we call a quick market study done, not a full-blown one, because uh, a full-blown one is fairly expensive. Um, but at times, this might be a helpful tool to, to allow the group to understand, well, here's a potentially a million to $4 million worth of sales. And, well, if we wanted to build a 10,000-square-foot store and, and we found out there was only a million dollars worth of sales available, it would make us, I think, go back to the drawing boards and readjust our um, what we're thinking we can accomplish. So this is a possibility. It's not always. It can be done by a professional, typically. Uh, we typically recommend people uh, to do this. Uh, I'm not sure if uh, you have a uh, you, you know technical, like a university or something in your town that might have a population uh, department that can help with these things. But again, this is not anything that's necessarily bankable. It's just a quick study to give the folks who are taking the process forward an idea of what, what do we have available to us. The work, the, once we understand this work, the uh, market, market potential, um, that will drive a lot of the ensuing work. And it's a key piece of data. It's a key piece of data to allow organizers to know whether they're on the right track or not. When we look at location feasibility, we look at is the store going to be visible? What's parking like? Um, is it easy to get in and out of the parking lot? Something uh, when I opened my first door, I never even thought about, and we had major problems uh, that actually cost us sales dollars at times. Is a synergy with the surrounding businesses. Uh, in other words, uh, are we opening a natural food store in a shopping mall? that has stores that lend to people who like to shop in natural food stores. Uh, a, a, is there a chiropractor in that area? Is there a, um, I'm not sure, is there a green, um, cl a green clothing store in that area? Those kinds of things. Are we opening in an area where there's a Walmart, Kmart? And if we are, is our store going to be appropriately uh, noticed? Are people going to come to this area for our kinds of business? Um, is the site we desire appropriate? That's what the location feasibility um, ultimately will tell us. It's not an issue usually until the market feasibility has been accomplished. One of the, one of the uh, areas that we've run into over time is that uh, we see a lot of uh, groups will use the fact that there's an available location to drive a project. Uh, we highly recommend that this is not the approach to driving a project. If there is, if there is um, a community that has adequate desire for a store, even if the one location that you see that's great get, um, is taken, you will find a location that will meet your needs. I have no doubt about this. More mistakes have been made by finding a location before the appropriate work is done and saying we have a location, let's open the store. More problems have occurred through that kind of thought than letting a, letting a uh, location go and coming back later to find an adequate location. Questions? I, I'm going to throw in one of my own here quick, if you don't mind. And that would be, I often have questions from organizing groups about, well, what's the difference really between a, this feasibility study you're talking about and, and a full-blown market study? Well, we're not talking about a feasibility study. We're talking about a feasibility process. Um, a full-blown market study is, uh, is a document that's a bankable document, typically. It would be part of your business plan or a, uh, an addendum to your business plan. It's, a, it's prepared by a, a technical a person who has the technical expertise to do it. And it's uh, fairly expensive. It could run anywhere from $7,500 to $12,000. I'll just pick out the broadest range possible, although I think it's closer to the 8 to 10 these days um, range. And that's a full-blown mark, and that will tell you, that will give you information that will say, here is the top line the sales projections that we can put into our financial projection and run, run our um, projections off of that. But when we're talking about feasibility, we just want to have a sense of 
um, is there enough information that tells us we should continue to move ahead? If not, then we have to stop, take a look, and see either we need to gather more information. Um, has it told us that we shouldn't be moving ahead at all because, like I say, um, you had a half a million dollars worth of sales available to you and, and you wanted to put a 4,000-square-foot store and you saw that it wasn't going to work, you might choose not to do anything. You might choose to, to drop the project at that point. So to me, the biggest difference is one is a technical and a professional uh, piece, of, um, piece of work that's used as part of your business planning process and used for your lenders. The other is more of a um, kind of, for lack of a better term, best guess by perhaps some uh, technical expert, but they will tell you they will not guarantee anything on a quick study. Or perhaps it's being done by your community doing some kind of survey. You know, you folks saying, well, we're going to survey our community how many people would come to a natural food store. It's nothing you can bank on, but it might tell you whether there's interest or not. Does that help, Stuart? Yeah, I think that helps a lot. Thanks. Okay. Well, financial feasibility. This is basically, you know, are we going to generate enough dollars um, to, to – to, at this point to get our feasibility work done. Ultimately, we're going to need to know if we're financially feasible for the whole project. But right now, is, you know, there's time and energy, like uh, what if you wanted to do hire somebody to do a quick market study just so you had a sense of that. Well, that probably costs dollars. So what we're looking here for financial feasibility at this point is do we have enough money to keep this process moving? Not do we have enough money to, to open up a store. That will come. That will come in the planning process. But right now we want to understand, do we have enough dollars, capital, um, to keep the project moving? Can we get grants, loans? Uh, can we, do we sell memberships? All those kinds of things. Uh, I'm not sure where the Speed Fund is yet, Stuart. Maybe you can speak to that a little bit. Or the Sprout Fund, um, that was something the uh, bank, in partnership with Co-op 500, the National Co-op Bank, and money's available to help people through some of these processes. Stuart, could you speak to the yeah. seed fund right now? Uh, at the moment, we're not accepting applications for the seed grant program. The grant program is, allows for co-ops, organizing groups, to apply for grants of up to $10,000 that they have to match with funds that they've raised. We do have funds committed to that over the next um, several years, and in the spring of next year, we will have at least $20,000 available for new grants. It doesn't a lot considering how many stores are out there looking for them, so obviously it's competitive. Uh, there may be more. We don't know yet. Uh, the Sprout Loan Fund uh, is a separate project that uh, is up to $25,000 that a co-op can borrow. It, it does need to be repaid. And more often that is uh, applied for and awarded to co-ops that are in uh, later stages of development as they're approaching the, they're, well, in the implementation stage where they have bills to pay, but they may not have finalized their, their formal final uh, bank loans and, and financing package. And so it's in some ways a bridge loan to help them get through that time period. Uh, that it can be applied for at any time. There is no uh, schedule for it. Uh, if you feel you're at a stage where you're ready to look at it, I would encourage you to contact me and, and talk about that process. Stuart, earlier on you said in the seat it's pretty competitive, correct? That's correct. Because there's not that much funds and there's a number of groups. Can you... How does the um, group who decides what is the how do they look at that in terms of what are the characteristics they look are they looking for characteristics or is it first come first serve kind of thing? Well, we're, we're looking for the groups that we feel have uh, the best likelihood of succeeding in opening a meaningful co-op that can serve the needs of their commun community and be successful in the long term. And you know it's pretty hard to judge that early on sometimes, but we, what we do look at is how well. The organizing group is uh, working with our development model, uh, whether they are consciously doing it or not, but have they got those four cornerstones in place? Do they have the systems, talent, capital? Uh, you know, uh, yeah, I can, never, I can never get four in a row. I'm sorry. Anyway, <laughs> if they've got their act together,
together and they clearly understand what's involved in the organizing process, if they have a community that looks like it can provide a feasible project, those are the kinds of things we're looking for. Great. Thank you. Mm -hmm. So we're looking, as I said, when we're looking at financial feasibility, we're basically looking at, at um, how do we, how do we um, support the work that needs to be done ahead of us. Now, how do we support the opening of the store? But we will also be looking at it. So when we're looking at that, we also want to start thinking about that. Uh, you know, where will money come from to keep moving this along? You know, what kinds of costs are we talking about? Uh, do, do we think that uh, we can operate the co-op in a financially successful manner? And eventually, during the planning process, we move financial feasibility to planning. We'll be looking at, you know, what does it look like? What are, what are our first five years of, of operations? What would they look like under the current, under the scenario of all the information that we bring to it? And that will be a place, and we'll look at it in a little bit, where you'll have decisions to make. One of the, um, one of the I think, one of the nice things about using a, um, a system, using our development model, is it, it asks you along the way to take take a step back, review what you've done, and make decisions to either move ahead, um, to to stay where you are, and to enhance your project, or perhaps to you might might be telling you this is a time when we're not able to move this project forward at all and want to leave it alone. But we, if you do it in an organized manner, it allows you to to, to make those kinds of decisions. And which will hopefully in the ultimately save us a lot of time, energy, and dollars. Uh, if a project is not feasible, but we don't understand that early, you know, as early on as possible, we continue to pour money and community resources into moving it along when we might be heading down to a dead end road. So one of the nice things about looking at the model and using a model, and then this goes for any pro any model and a, a solid process, is that at times we want to take a step back sit down, review what we've done, and make sure that what we've done in the past we're very secure with, it's the best work we could do before we move forward, or if it needs to be strengthened, that we will spend some time strengthening things that we thought we had done with before we move forward. My assumption and I, I, is that everybody wants to open a successful store. Sometimes it's a, uh, some of the process to get there uh, can feel uh, difficult, can feel constraining, can feel... Uh, a heavy burden, but the concept is that by using the process, we protect our community from spending undue amounts of energy and resources to something that might not work, or we show early on how possible it is and we can create energy and capital in the community because we have the real bright light in front of us. Design feasibility. Uh, again, this is something that has been in the past, not as much now as we're moving forward in the last couple of years, but has been overlooked. Um, we might have a uh, a market feasibility a market feasibility study says, oh, we might be able to do up to two or three or four million dollars. The questions are, will the store be able to meet those projected sales? We have to set up stores are they're technical entities, and people understand traffic flows and and those kinds of issues in, all, in order to set up a store to maximize its sales potential or whatever the potential is you're looking to accomplish. If it's more of a community a gathering, then we need to look at the store in that light. Uh, but one of the things is we'll be able to meet our projected sales and other organizational needs, community rooms, uh, all those kinds of things. The store able to allow for efficient and effective operation. Uh, you know, we come from a history of stores back in the... 70s, 80s, and into the 90s, and perhaps there are some out there now, aisles are two and a half, three foot wide, two people can't go down the aisle at the same time. It doesn't mean you can't be successful with a store like that, but it certainly puts a strain on, on the store, and it puts a strain on the ability to grow. So we want to look at this, can, it, can the store be uh, set up to allow for an efficient and effective uh, flow and operation? And then we also want to understand what, what are we talking about? How much will it cost uh, for a, a fully decorated and equipped store? Uh, decoration is, in the food business, is fairly significant uh, in terms of people's image of your store. And that's, you know, subtlety of colors, um, signage, uh, designs on the wall, um, flooring, lighting, all kinds of things like that. So we want to take a look at 
all these different areas. We want to look in the retail area, but not just the retail area. We want to look in the back room, administrative needs, and again, community approach. Do we need a community room? Um, is there going to be another business run out of the store for the community? Um, those kinds of things. One area that is uh, again is overlooked a number of, in a number of places, and it's, it's a lot of times due to cost cutting needs, is administrative needs. Uh, how many how many offices do we need? I, I'm in a number of stores where I've been in a store recently where the general manager has their office in the back room where the deliveries come in, and they have an open desk, and there is no room for the general manager or for the bookkeeper or for any other um, employee. I sit there and I sit and wonder, how do you have a personnel discussion with an employee? How do you, how do, you do an interview? And it's, it's strained. So these are important things to consider, even though they don't, they're not the front of the store, which is what we're most attracted to typically. Your store design, you know, it's going to be with you for a lot of years. People, you know, even if you make adjustments, it typically won't happen after, until after probably your first five years, significant adjustments. And so an effective design can save you lots of dollars, increase sales, and it can save you injuries, too, an efficient and effective design. Injuries for workers, certainly, over the long run. So it's an important component, and we want to look at it carefully. Again, this is the feasibility stage. We are not going to get into every little detail, but we want to start getting a well-rounded understanding of what are we talking about when we talk about design. Still, when you open fresh, when you open uh, just foods, um, what kind of design work was done prior to opening? Well, I was uh, hired about. Um well, I was hired in the middle of May. We opened in uh, early December, so I had I was involved in a lot of that. Um, although the basic floor plan had been created by the board in consultation with P.J. Hoffman already, um, I looked at it um, using my own experience. I, I did make some adjustments or recommended some adjustments in office space. And um, interestingly, I, I think after we opened, we realized very quickly that there were other issues that we'd missed. Um, for example, we did not have enough backroom storage to meet our deliveries, although uh, part of that was because our store uh, had the great fortune to have higher than expected sales after we opened, and, um, which isn't always the case. And uh, so we ended up, le fortunately, we, there was additional space in the building that we could lease, and we, we made that arrangement fairly quickly. Um, but I think that it's pretty common to see floor layout plans for new co-ops that don't take into account the need for office space uh, in particular. And, and I say that because I think that the, uh, the, the managers, the department managers, the general managers, the accountants, Everybody is now needs a desk and a computer. In the past, there may have been one or two people that were office people in a store, and everybody else worked on the floor. And there's still some adjusting, I think, going on in the in the way that stores are designed to accommodate that. So uh, be be cautious about uh, you know those that's not so-called productive space, but I think it's uh, often overlooked, and it does definitely affect your ability to be productive when your managers have the adequate space. Uh, and equipment and resources they need to do their jobs well. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, um, and Stuart mentioned just a little something, but it's kind of interesting to me. He just talked about back room space. Um, there is no one size fits all here. Uh, a store, one the same store might have different needs for back room space depending on the delivery cycle. So if you're a store out in um, in a more rural area and get a once a week delivery, your backroom needs might be much greater than a store in a more urban area that gets three or four times a week delivery due to the amount of product you have to keep on hand. These are things that we, as lay people, uh, a lot of times just wouldn't have any idea that that's a, a component of establishing a successful uh, physical facility. So the, that's when, and Stuart mentioned P.J. Hoffman, who works through uh, CCDS, and he also works through um, UNFI, I was going to say Blooming Prairie, but that's gone. Um, and uh, PJ has done hundreds and hundreds of store designs, and uh, he's a very knowledgeable person and highly recommend uh, you know, that you look into his work uh, as you move along when, it, when it's appropriate. Does PJ have a session here at all? I, I don't think he does. 
No, he doesn't. I just made a note that that's a good idea for our next round. Okay. Okay. Thanks. Did you want to take any other questions right now, Mel? I've got a couple. Sure, this, is a, this is a great time. Okay. Uh, this one goes back a little bit in your presentation, but uh, the question is, it sounds like there's a rule of thumb for the amount of sales needed to sustain a certain size store. Do you oh, was, that, was that rule of thumb was the first word? Uh, it was yeah, it, is there a rule of thumb for how much sales you need to sustain a certain size store? No, there, are, there is not, and, and the reason is because the one of the reasons is because the finances of a, of a certain size store would be different depending on the community it's in. So a 4,000 square foot store in Minneapolis, I assume, would be paying higher rent or higher purchase price than a 4,000 square foot store in rural Indiana. So that's, you know, we, we start off with very different cost structures. And since all sales are generated to meet the cost structure, um, it's hard, you can't come up with a rule of thumb. Uh, typically, though, we have been looking at uh, not not the amount of sales, but the size of stores. And, and correct me if I'm wrong, Stuart, but we're looking at like kind of 4,000 square foot stores being sort of a, a basis for people to start thinking about, as opposed to in the past, a lot of people were thinking about 1,500 square foot stores or 2,000 square foot stores. But to answer the question, no, I, I do not know of any rule of thumb. If you have any, please offer it for a cost per a cost structure for a store. It really is everything is specific to a store. We don't know whether you'll be doing a lot of leasehold improvements or not. Um, you know, we're not sure whether you're con if you rent a store that has equipment in it compared to starting a new. So there's all different kinds of cost structure that will impact your sales needs to make it successful. We, we usually recommend 3,000 square feet of retail space, which uh, is typically two thirds of the total. So four to five thousand square feet of gross uh, is the current recommendation. And I would say that although there isn't a rule of thumb, the sources and uses budget and and your pro forma financials, which were the previous week's uh, webinar, are the tools that help you find that out. And and if you just you happen to miss that webinar, it is available on a recorded uh, from the registration site. Thank you. Is there another question there, Stuart? I have one other. Uh, yes. Um, let's see here. How does a co-op deal with the feasibility that says uh, a store can be successful, but they aren't finding that they have community support, uh, that there are other businesses in the area that are sole proprietors or chains that, that may be doing um, some competitive business, for example, and that they're not able to find to, to bring the community together, even though theoretically the market is there for them. I would then go back to that uh, organizing stage. That sounds to me like if, if you were running into that issue. Um, so what what I'm hearing is that there might be the dollars available, but not so that people will spend those dollars in your store. Um, and if that's what if that's correct, then I think it's more it goes back to the organizing issue, more community meetings. Uh, you know, uh, making sure that the education uh, component is, is really ramped up. Um, those kinds of things are how you get communities at least to, to start piquing their interest, uh, dispelling perhaps some people's views of what a cooperative is or educating people as to what a cooperative is. But we find in lots of communities, um, even though they might even, even farm communities where there are co-ops, people aren't as used to consumer co-ops as they are to produce a co-ops in some communities. So I think it has to do with that organizing and, and the communication to community um, process. Certainly, if you don't feel you can draw in the, the, the sales, you need to work on that aspect before you move ahead. Anything else we have there? Uh, that takes care of the questions we have on the board right now. Okay. So let's take one uh, look at the uh, last component of of feasibility, um, let's take a look at the organizational feasibility. I'm not sure. Mel, can you 
I am here. Who else is here? Stuart, are you there? I was just going to ask if we had lost Mel. Uh, yeah, I'm here. It sounds like we might have lost Mel. I will uh, hang up and call Mel. In the meantime, if there are... Uh, Actually, you know what, Marilyn, could you do that instead? Because mine I sure is will. all tied into um, this recording setup here. Will do. Hey, Stuart. Yes. <laughs> I just told you a whole bunch of stuff, but I had muted my line. <laughs> well, that, that works well, yes. <laughs> Um, so I had stopped recording, but it looks like you have enough enough uh, Q and A here for you just to keep things going. Why don't you do well, that? Actually, a lot of them have been in regards to not being able to hear. However, um, uh, here we go. Uh, we do have a question about what would constitute a quick market study. Anybody else would like to take a stab at that? Otherwise, I can. I think it's just me and you, Stuart, and I would rather you do that. All right. Well, a quick market study, there's a couple different ways that can be done. Uh, some groups are able to work with a local community college, or not, not necessarily a community college, but a local university or college that has a marketing program and find a student group that wants to take that on as a project. Uh, that is not recommended for your formal market study. You need professionals to do that because it requires the, the experience and the databases that they have to really be a bankable study. But for a quick market study up front, that can be a very low cost, sometimes even free way to get a, a basic understanding of what your market is. It's possible that uh, you can do it yourselves uh, using uh, demographic yeah. online. Oh, Mel, welcome back. Sorry, I don't know what's going on here. I'm working on a cell phone in a strange area, but anyway, here I am. The better right. for work. Well, we were just taking a couple of questions in your absence and uh, up that description, although I, it's, a, it's a very brief one. Uh, as far as the question had, having been, what was a, what constitutes a quick market study? And, uh, you know, if we have time, we can come back to that, but I'd like to let Mel get back on track. Sorry about that, folks. Yep, no problem. We're, uh, we're going to take a look. I don't believe we've gotten into it. I don't know the organizational feasibility. But um, had, had when did I cut out? Did I cut out as this in the middle of this? You cut out just before the slide came up. Okay, great. Thank you. So do we have appropriate skill sets um, or access to appropriate skill sets for the project? The folks who are the steering committee or the board, whoever's leading the project, doesn't necessarily have to have every skill set available to make a successful project, but sure as heck better understand where you can access those skill sets as needed. Um, will the board, is the board going to be educated in best practices? Will we have a board that understands how to communicate to the community, its members, how to communicate to its management, and how to interpret what the community wants for its management? Uh, this is a very key issue. Uh, we find that as in many areas of the world, education is sort of lower on the list at times, uh, especially when it comes down to dollars being spent. Do we want a cooler or do we want to do board training? Well, um, I can't answer the, I can't give you the answer to any specific question, but I can tell you that uh, it's an investment. It's not an expense, board training. It's an investment in your future. If it's only looked at as an expense, there's no need to do it, but it is an absolute investment. Do we have an adequate structure to encompass changes as needs change? Obviously, you cannot um, forecast all the potential changes that will be coming, but is your structure somewhat flexible? So that you, you know, or is it going to be very rigid? And if something happens outside of that, you'll be unable to deal with it, or at least it will take a lot of energy and effort to deal with it. What's your decision-making approach? Is it appropriate to make effective decisions? Um, there's plenty of decision-making approaches. There's, you know, there's priority. There's uh, consensus. There's, you have to. You, each group has to define for itself what works best for its group. There is no one way to do this. Again, it's, it's different cultures and different communities and different groups, and we have to take and you have to take that into account as you determine the best way to move forward. Will we will we be able to attract qualified management? Um, Nothing like a disorganized organization to attract disorganized management. <laughs> we find this time there's a lot of uh, a lot of need out there for qualified management. The pool 
for co-ops is seemingly small. So a stellar organization has a better opportunity um, to attract qualified management than an organization that is not quite sure what's going on. Um, and, you know, an organization that can tell its managers, here's how we communicate, here's how we make decisions. Our board is trained. I, as a former general manager, would love to hear that before I took a job, as opposed to, we're going to take care of this eventually. Questions on, fe on the organizational feasibility? If not, we're going to move next into some of the planning components. And again, much of feasibility obviously moves right into planning. Um, we get uh, grounded in feasibility. We understand what's possible, perhaps, and what's not. And then we take that and we move towards the planning stage. And planning components we will review today are an organizational plan, financial plan, a business plan, which is typically the major plan that people think about because that's the thing that we take to the banks or to our member lenders, um, management plan, and a board development plan. When we're taking a look at an organizational plan. We're looking at uh, have we, do we have a mission, a vision? Um, what's our organizational structure? Not necessarily the store internal structure, but the bigger, the, the cooperative structure. The store structure can remain, can be a little more fluid, a lot more fluid actually. When you establish the organizational structure, uh, it's, it could be part of your bylaws perhaps, in which case it would take, a, it would take a, a concerted effort to make changes. But just to be recognizing that there's a difference between an organizational structure and an operational or store structure. Okay? Because this is a cooperative, it's not a store. The cooperative might be running a store but the cooperative might also choose in the future to run other businesses. So these are two separate entities or two separate structures. And you know, how are we going to communicate with members? Is it going, are we going to have regular updates? Uh, what we see, and perhaps some of you are already involved in it, is what we see in the last few years growing and growing is the email or listserv approach to communicating with members. That it's obviously cost effective, it's efficient, um, whether it accommodates all potential new members or not is another question because it's hard to believe, but we're not all computer illiterate and we don't all have computer computers at this point in time. But what is that process? And how often, and not just how, not just the medium, but what are we going to communicate? Um, and, you know, and when are we going to ask members to step forward for their energy? And when are we going to just be giving information to members? And other things here, Stuart, that I'm missing, or Marilyn, if you can chime in. No, I, just that the the communication piece is so critical during organi during organization. Uh, there are groups that do it very well, and others that seem to think of it as an afterthought, and it comes back to haunt them. So I really encourage you to be consistent in finding a good way to talk to your owner members and the community as frequently as possible. Even if you think that it's information that everybody should know, a lot of times it just it, it doesn't get out as well as you think it does. And repeating it doesn't hurt a thing. Great. I agree with that. Uh, I've been involved in a couple of startups and um, we would have four general uh, probably once a month general community meetings and at the end of those we'd sit down and People would say, well, I think the community has heard uh, you know, what we have. And, and other people would say, well, you know, some of the community has heard. We've had, you know, whatever it was, three or 400 people attend over the course of the four meetings. But for the store to be successful, you know, we might need to have thousands of people involved. So uh, you cannot, probably cannot communicate too much. It's probably going to be difficult to do that. Yeah, I, I would concur with all of that. And I think this, the organizational plan is in some ways the most challenging because it's the least tangible. The financial plans, you've got a nice spreadsheet, you've got numbers, you can see if, you know, the, the, uh, in, if it indicates success. The market studies tells you whether or not you're, you, you have the potential to be successful. The organizational plan is harder to have real hard and fast criteria about whether or not you've, you're done, whether you've done adequate planning in this area. So just because of that um, and because of the, the importance of 
uh, risks that can happen if you don't adequately plan. I think it's one of the areas to just be really sure that you don't overlook and, and you really pay uh, extra attention to this area of the planning. Great, thank you. Yeah, if you think about it, if, if you have a mission, if say your mission was um, a big component of your mission was education, um, your organizational structure might be different than um, uh, a group who didn't have education as a big part and was running a successful grocery store was really what they were all about. So it's, it is, and Marilyn is, is absolutely correct that it is uh, a little um, less, it's a lot less tangible. And so, uh, but you know, typically what I see in groups is we always have good process people. <laughs> it's just usually some good process people. Some, and, and, and those are the kinds of people that can typically help us get through um, this kind of planning process, the organizational part. We move on to financial planning. Well, financial planning, this is when we, you know, we take, this is when we're starting to get into real nuts and bolts here of uh, are we going to be able to run a successful store? It's going to include sources and uses, which is, you know, where, what, how much money is this project going to cost us, and where is that money going to come from? Uh, pro forma financial projections, which are uh, typically five years uh, of financial projections with the first year by month, but uh, it's typically a five-year plan. Um, where a capital acquisition plan, um, uh, there have going to be member loans. Is that one of the ways you're going to raise capital? A member equity drive plan. Will you be accessing grants, community loans? Are you going to be dealing with outside lenders? So it's not just the pro forma, but it's these other who's going to support us in making this pro forma real. We have to bring, we can do the best pro forma, but on the uh, sources side, we still have to do a lot of work to make sure that we can bring in the capital that it's going to take to start up a successful business. And out of all of these, um, one of the areas that I typically recommend that you start real early on is your outside lenders. If you're going to be using outside lenders, establish a relationship with them as early as possible in your process. Perhaps they can even help you with your financial planning. Um, but you can never be too close to your lender uh, uh, on this in, in terms of getting getting it going. Many lenders, especially in communities where cooperatives are not um, are not out there, many lenders are not that familiar. So there might need to be a, a few lunch meetings just to educate the lender as to the you know what a cooperative is. A lot of times, smaller banks or lenders that don't understand this, they want to. Well, whose house are we going to put up as collateral? So they need to understand the cooperative structure. Um, but you can never, I don't believe you can, you can meet and greet with outside lenders too early in the process. The other thing is you want to meet with a few to start evaluating who's looking to work with you and, and who might not be. Questions about financial planning? Uh, nothing has come in, so. Okay. And we will have some time at the end for general questions. And you know, obviously, um, we've got we've we've spent plenty of time on financial planning. We spent a minute and twelve seconds, and that's all we ever need to spend on financial planning. Obviously, it's a long process and and um, uh, one that you know needs a lot of examination. And typically, financial plans are rewritten and rewritten and rewritten. I've never seen a first draft. Uh, come be the final draft. So, you know, be, be prepared for many rewrites. Business planning. This is um, typically uh, the key document, you know, the, the key product that you're going to produce for your lenders. Uh, what will it include? Who's going to write it? And by the way, on the, the purples, I should have mentioned this earlier, uh, I, assume most, I assume you can see the variation in color, whatever color it is on your screen. Those are areas that I'm suggesting that there needs to be some technical expertise. This doesn't mean you have to hire somebody. You might have that technical expertise amongst your group. But the, uh, the purple areas are areas that this is something that it's not a matter of, well, I've never done it, but I think I can do it. These are, this is important that you have somebody with some technical expertise. Either do it or critique it or whatever, but don't let it go through with somebody who just has great desire, but not necessarily the expertise. Um, when will it be finalized? I find that if you don't put timelines on things, if you don't um, have endpoints, sometimes they just go on and on and on to the frustration of many. Um, 
it's it's one one area that well we'll take a look at in a second. Let me, let me just move to what a this is a, a typical organization of a business plan. Um, different sections of it, and I, the, the only thing I want to highlight here is the one on challenges and risk, because we find I certainly find that this is an area that is not explored appropriately and is a rarely rarely a good plan to deal with that. So what does that mean? Perhaps you have a market study that says you can do $3 million worth of sales, and you build your financial plan based upon $3 million worth of sales. Well, in your business planning process, somebody has to say, well, what if we don't hit $3 million? What if we miss it by 10 or 15%? What do we do if we come in at $2.5 million? And it's really healthy to state that in the plan, you know, so um, not, not hitting your sales goal. But then also, what will we do if we do not hit our sales goal? What, and it doesn't have to be a pointed, specific action by action process, but what are the areas you're going to look at? Uh, look at reducing labor, look at uh, enhancing marketing, look at reducing um, outside contractors, whatever it is, just so that the final product, when you hand this to a lender, they recognize, and it's also, <laughs> well, it, they recognize that you have seen that there are potential risks. It's not all pie in the sky, and that you are, uh, do have some approaches to deal with those risks if they come to fruition. This is a very important thing, and it's, it's most important for you as, as a group of people in an organization because my experience is that I've never seen a store that all of its planning happens as a plan. There's always things that go awry or challenges that happen in, in, in the process. And if you have spent time as a group saying, if we have a problem here, what's our approach? If you spend time before you're in that problem, you're much more level-headed and much more able to have a clearer picture of how to approach dealing with that problem or issue that arises. It's good, it's good work for you. It's good, it's good information for the bank. A business plan is two things to me we tend to focus on the one, which is the product. At the end of the business plan, you have a 10, 20, 30-page document uh, that you can hand to potential lenders or hand to people in the community to show, here's what, we, here's what we're going to do. That's great, and that's needed. But I find the bigger value is in the process, not just the product. The process of working the business plan, of talking about who our market is, of talking about what our business objectives is, of discussing what potential risks are out there, of looking at what the industry is like. Those kinds of things educate your, your community or your group of people, your board, your steering committee, your steering committee and man, you might have management at that time. Uh, it educates you all into so you have a shared sense of what's available and what's out there. So the process, to me, is probably more important than the product but the product is what the lenders want to see. Questions on business planning? Yeah, we do have a couple. Um, are the challenge the challenge risk section? Uh, are we talking a chapter in the business plan or a section of the business plan, or is it just uh, something that's integrated through the discussion of the other sections? I, I would I would actually I would pull it out, look at your key indicators uh, of success and think about, well, what if we don't hit one of these key indicators? What's our approach? If we don't hit sales, what if our labor is high? Those kinds of things. So, yeah, I, I would see it as a separate section. Okay. And um, this one is, is not entirely on business plan, but I think it's a good question. Uh, we have a group that's having trouble with getting a common vision or losing a common vision, I think, in reaction to the sources and uses budget, which provides a budget that they don't feel is attainable, uh, that they could raise that much money. So rather than having a, a joint vision of pursuing the original goal of a certain size store, they're looking at cutting back to something that they feel is more affordable. Now, what would you recommend in that situation? Well, um, <laughs> one thing is um, one thing we recognize is that many communities underestimate their ability to raise some capital. Um, some of us overestimate, but many communities do underestimate. Um, so, you know, we have uh, any of you were on last? That was last week. Was Bill Gessner on? 
um, Bill, this is the kind of work Bill does well. I mean, he talks to you about what is possible. I would say that if it's a confusion in the group itself, in other words, if some people feel one way and some people feel another, that it might be good to bring an outside party in on some level to facilitate a share, because you have to have a shared vision. Uh, moving forward without a shared vision would be, um, I think, would be very dangerous. I would suggest that perhaps, an, whether it's uh, just a, a local facilitator, but you know, what, bring somebody from the outside in to help you get back on track as to we can share this. Now, it's not inappropriate at times to say, you know, we don't think we can raise this money. Let's scale it back. That's not necessarily inappropriate. But where the trouble sounds like to me, where the problems could be, is if some people feel that way and others don't, and you want to be on the same page, come to uh, an understanding and agreement, move forward. So, the, you know, I, I, both scaling back is, might be appropriate, but also I think bringing in a, an outside party who isn't vested in the outcome but just vested in creating um, – synergy between the groups so that they can come up to their own conclusion for an outcome, that would be most important. But Ma Marilyn, I'd ask you on this one, because Marilyn does a lot of this process work. I think the, the point that you made that you really do need to get everybody on the same page is correct. But that does not mean that everybody has to be 100% in agreement with every aspect of it. But you have to be on the same page. And I think um, if you're not, it's worth it to slow down and take the time to, to get on the same page and, um, and um, make sure that, that you are going forward. You, it's too soon in the process to have the group splinter off, and that's not going to be productive. You, you won't be able to raise money if, you have to, if, if the board or the leadership group is split on whether or not it's, it's possible. So I think um, I think you're right with looking at well let's let's uh, talk this through. Uh, maybe there's a specialist in your community who who uh, has skills in this kind of fundraising and capitalization. Um, it'll be interesting to see in today's economy how things play out in terms of of raising money. Uh, I think there are a lot of folks who are thinking that the, the, the methods that they used for investments in the past weren't very smart investments, or at least in the short run aren't going to pay back. So maybe investing in a, in a local community-owned uh, community and controlled enterprise might be more appealing today than it was six months or a year ago for, for people's investments. So I, I don't think it's, um, I think it's useful to look at it from a lot of different perspectives and, and see really what the areas of concerns are and, and what the pros, both the pros and the cons are. I'm going to interject just for a second. I apologize. I'm going to need to leave the call. There are several more good questions on this. It really resonated, I think. Um, thank you all for coming, and I'll look forward to talking to you next week. Thanks, Stuart. Stuart, how can you leave us? <laughs> get up on your feet and sort of walk through the door. <laughs> Mel, I'm going to channel Stuart. <laughs> okay. Uh, let me let me just at least speak one second before we get to the next question. But it, it, I just want to make sure that that you that I'm real clear that it's sometimes you have the most well-meaning and skillful group of people involved in the project, and there will be disagreements or different perspectives, obviously. Uh, and in fact, that's healthy, and we want that. At times, that group might not be the best group to come to a shared conclusion, or as Marilyn says, it doesn't have to be fully shared by everybody. And that's why I recommend that if you feel like you're stuck, that you might need somebody from outside just to help you come to a, a shared conclusion. So, uh, Mark, any uh, other questions on that? Uh, uh, thanks, Mel. Here's, here's a, a great follow-up for that. Uh, it seems like uh, we are dealing uh, with that um, uh, confusion issue when we get new people involved and we're constantly revisiting store size, even though the original board agreed to focus on one size. Uh, what do you suggest for that? Well, it, it, probably anybody who gets involved, I mean, if you're talking about in, say, the steering committee or boards group, perhaps they need an orientation by one or two board members, you know, for uh, over coffee for a half hour, an hour, one day, so that because um, they, they're going to have to go through, they're going to have to hear it. It's not just a matter of we discussed it. They're going to have to hear the rationale. But do you want to use everybody's time um, to do that at every time a new person enters? So I would suggest that. And secondly, is documenting. 
documenting as you move along is really helpful because then you have a series of documents you can say to somebody, here, read our meeting minutes as to how we got to this place. So uh, if you document your process and, and take meeting minutes and document decisions and the rationale, uh, perhaps it's just a matter of having somebody educate themselves before they even volunteer to be a part of it. Because, you know, so why have somebody want to volunteer and then it's not, the organization is not moving in the direction they had hoped it to move to and would rather not be involved. So I think, um, go ahead, Mark. Well, I was just going to say, and maybe in addition to that level of documentation, a group could also um, really prepare kind of that vision statement that also had, you know, enough detail so that this type of information or question would be presented as part of the vision and maybe even, you know, some, some of the rationale that went into, you know, coming to that place so that it was yes, you know, so so people didn't have to go through the minutes to really get what the vision is and the rationale that supports it. And so you can have it on a piece of paper that you could, you know, pass around. I, I would agree. I would say that probably they'll need to see the backup information, yeah. <laughs> but, uh, but anyway, yeah, and so those are two potential ways. I think actually, you know, sitting with a couple, uh, what we used to do in one of, our, one of the boards I was involved with, anytime somebody was running for the board, wanted to run, we would sit with them before the election and talk about the organization and, and everything we could help them with so they could understand that prior to actually throwing a hat in the ring um, and making sure that this is the organization that they wanted to be a part of. Um, hey, Mel, do you know anything about uh, the warehouse model that Emmerville COG Grocery Co-op is pursuing? I'm not familiar with Emmerville. Uh, uh, if we're talking buying clubs for warehouse model, I, I'm, not, no, I'm, not, I'm not familiar with that, so I won't even guess at what it is. Okay, so there was a question on that. And then um, the other question that we have hanging out is asking if um, – have you seen any of these that are self-funding as they went along as opposed to borrowing money? If so, how? Never seen any. I have never seen them. Uh, Marilyn or Mark, you can chime in if you've seen. I've never seen anything that's self-funding. Um, obviously, operationally, we expect it to be self-funding after a certain period of time. That's a successful store. But uh, startup. Um, you know, I have not seen it. Uh, it's usually, uh, it usually needs capital, which is one of the reasons that the bank, the and National Co-op Bank and, and uh, the Co-op 500 organization put out the seed and crowd funds for recognition, recognition that there needs to be some funding and it's not necessarily easily accessible to groups. Um, that was one of the reasons that they established these funds. I'm not familiar at all with self-funding from the beginning groups. Oh, no, I'm not either. I think uh, uh, grocery stores, food stores, any kind of service business requires capital, and, and it's it's got to come from somewhere. There's uh, certainly a portion of that is going to have to come from the owners of the business, the member owners, whatever your term for them is. Um, but there's nothing... Nothing wrong with borrowing uh, money from using that the members' money to borrow other people's money, uh, money, money from a bank or financial institutions. You know that's that's what they're there for. And if you if you try to fund it 100% with with member capital, then the amount of money you're you're really going to have to raise is is pretty high. Um, I know. I, I'm still on the phone. I just don't have the computer. Uh, I do know of a store that did open with no loans, uh, but there's, they had to struggle to stay open and or were not able to pay employees. Uh, I don't recommend it. You know, there, there might be some economic grants in your community that make it easier to access capital. Uh, that's not going to put um, a obligation uh, other than the performance, but not a financial obligation on an organization. Uh, I've been involved with some places where there's a revolving loan fund in the community where uh, if you have good plans and you present them to a board in the community, they might offer five, ten, twenty thousand dollars $20,000 to move through a kind of a feasibility stage. But uh, and so that's, I guess that's enough said about that. I think you need to be prepared to borrow money. As Marilyn said, you need to be prepared. This is a business. This is a business, and the business is going to need capital and hopefully is going to produce capital over time. 
move on now, Mark? Yes, sir. Okay. So management plan. Management plan, ultimately, we're looking to hire a general manager. But, you know, it's not just, well, it can be as simple as putting an ad out, but I wouldn't recommend it. Um, you want to know where to look. You want to have a job description um, or at least an, a solid outline of a job description so that when, the, when candidates ask about it, you have something to talk about and, and they can understand what their responsibilities will be. Uh, a salary benefit package, um, you know, what's, a lot of times people talk about what's affordable and that's one aspect of determining it, but also what's the market. Uh, you know, maybe my store's uh, got $30,000 that it can pay for a general manager, and I'm in the market. I'm in the Minneapolis, and retail store managers are making $50,000. Um, we have to take that into account. Uh, when to bring a manager on, a general manager on board? Um, ra rarely, but once in a while, um, some people will hire them, and that person will actually be the project manager moving into the general manager. But those are different skill sets and not everybody who's qualified to be a general manager has a project management skill set and vice versa. And just because we know a lot about the business doesn't mean we can successfully run the business. Um, how do we go into monitor performance and give feedback to the general manager? This is key uh, for, for any of us who have been general managers. Uh, knowing how we're doing is really important. And having a both formal and informal way of receiving that information is important. Um, are there clear expectations and are there expectations, are they clear because there are specific goals for my management? This is a, these are, we've seen a number of organizations hire somebody without being prepared to hire them and sort of the general manager ends up doing half of this kind of work. I think that's uh, a symptom of a, a, an organization that's not ready. So this is, a, this is an important part. If you want, you want to have a long-term Strong relationship with a good general manager. That's one of the best um, best recipes for success. Not not guaranteed, but it's one of the best recipes for success. Having a good, strong relationship with your general manager. And if you, as an organizing group or as a board, and at the time I assume you'd be a board by the time you're hiring for sure, if you have done your homework well. Um, and you have done, you will have a general manager that is most what more likely to be appropriate and more likely to stick with you than if it's haphazard approach. Questions about management plan? No, sir. Board development plan. Look at all of the asterisks on this one. <laughs> Gee, I thought it would be easy. Well, there's all kinds of um, things to discuss and to determine, and your startup groups are the best groups to start working with this. What's going to be the first board composition? Typically, when we start out, we're not a formal organization. We're a group of people who have a similar desire, um, and we move, we're trying to move a process along. Uh, what we find works best is when the steering committee, which is the group, typically the, uh, the organizing group, the group that gets it going, usually it's best to have them become the first board because of the history that they have, and that's something to think, you know, that they understand where the project came from, what the community wants, and we would like to see that, keep that continuity moving forward. Um, so that's something to consider. How a board member is going to be recruited. Um, all too often we see who's available on Tuesday nights or who's available. And that's, you know, that's one component of being a board member, but that's not the major component. What are the I, I like to think about is what are the skill sets we need and can we bring in people with those skill sets? Now, it doesn't mean that people who don't have a specific skill set can't be on the board and can't add to our process, but we don't want to have a board of nine people with zero skill sets for what we're going to do and do it just because they're well-meaning. I don't think that that's the answer to a successful organization. Is there going to be a committee structure, which uh, seems to work well for almost every co-op that I know? And what would those committees be? How would they report? What would be their, um, what would be their charter, so to speak? What would be their authority? Do they make decisions? Do they bring decisions back to the whole board? Those kinds of discussions need to happen. Length of terms of board members. Um, staggered is always recommended so that the whole board doesn't turn over in any one year. For nine-member boards, sometimes there's <clears throat> one, two, and three-year seats to begin with so that every year there's three people turn over, but that you keep, keep good continuity. 
I'm watching meeting structure. One of the more frustrating aspects for both board and management in meetings, whether it's any kind of meeting, but a lot of times board meetings, is a, a lack of a meeting structure. And Robert's rules, I don't put down as the end all and be all as just one example, but whatever it is, I think it's very important to discuss what are your norms. Will people raise, are you we're going to raise our hands? Uh, you know, do I get a chance to, how do we talk? How do we get recognized as somebody writing down who's next, sort of a key, who's next uh, to speak? Um, how we, you know, all those kinds of things. How do we keep a meeting effective and efficient? Because we usually have somewhere between six and ten people at these meetings, and that's a lot of time and energy, and we don't want to waste that time and energy. Meetings that go on for three, you, you budget, you say the meeting's going to be an hour and a half, and they go on for two and a half, three hours, everybody's wiped out at the end of those and not desiring to come back to another meeting. So it's, it's important. It seems like a little thing, but I think it's, it's significantly important. I work a lot with management on management team meetings, on structuring them, because it's the same issue. An inefficient, ineffective meeting, uh, it, it actually zaps energy out of people, and an efficient, effective meeting gives people energy. Um, again, how you make decisions, how, how you operate. Policy governance is, is what is um, the recommended, what the CCDS is recommending, and what we have a number of people working with boards um, either training them in policy governance or helping them along the boards that have already established policy governance. It is the key model that we are recommending to all new co-ops and as old, older co-ops want to make transitions. Um, there's a, you know, a lot of a lot to learn around policy governance for myself and I assume for most of us. So, you know, how do we want to operate is a big question. And once we understand that, do we have the information to operate in that manner? We see policy governance, we see some at some places, boards call themselves policy governance boards, don't really operate in that style. So it's just something to be, you want to be educated into how we're going to run this, uh, this organization. That's really key. In board education training, you know, there's plenty of opportunity. Um, I'm not sure if you're familiar with uh, CCMA, um, which is an annual meeting of uh, board uh, cooperative consumer cooperative management and board people that moves around the country. It's got tons of educational tracks in it that for people to attend. Um, regular board and initial and regular board training sessions by a professional is highly recommended. Um, there are publications such as the Co-op Grocer that are available. Uh, so um, and if you if you see that uh, website uh, down there, there's information on that website that can help move you along for board development, uh, planning, and, and education. Questions about board development planning? Hello? Jesus Christ. <laughs> sorry, Mel. <laughs> oh, I'm sorry. I thought I was off the phone already. It got me nervous. I apologize. <laughs> Uh, no questions from from the uh, from the attendees on uh, board development. I'd just like to okay. say that we uh, at in the CDS Consulting Co-op we have a, a team that works to support boards of, of ongoing food co-ops and and we'll be happy to entertain your uh, your inquiries about that. I apologize for the JC comments, but I was alone. Um, what to accomplish during the feasibility stage. Okay, so we're going, and some of these things, um, they're ongoing because we say we want to accomplish during the feasibility stage. doesn't necessarily mean that it's over and done. It might be. Some things might be, okay, we've got the information and now we're ready to move on. But uh, research, you know, I don't believe that you ever stop research. <laughs> I think you're always looking at, you know, what's changing because it's a changing market. We know um, economically right now it's an incredibly changing time, uh, time, scary too. So we want to continually keep our uh, um, ears out there to understand what's going on and uh, so research. But we do want to accomplish all these initial research on these areas that we talked about. And we want, to, uh, we want to get some basics down so that we're able to move ahead. We want to assess what technical assistance we need. Um, as I said, there might be a half a dozen areas that we've already talked about that uh, need technical assistance. Perhaps some of that is already in your organization, that technical assistance. Perhaps not. Uh, if you want to set up um, an accounting system, probably not the store accounting system, but the board sort of accounting system before you have a store. Perhaps you have an accountant on your board and they can do it where you don't need somebody from the outside. 
perhaps you don't have an account nor somebody who or a bookkeeper who understands that, in which case you might want to spend a little bit of money to have somebody help you establish something simple but effective. Um, Fine-tuning your development plan, establishing some basic systems, as in finance is one of them, the, how does money flow, um, you know, how communication systems to members, uh, uh, communication amongst uh, the startup group itself, a number of just basic systems as you move along. And remember, a systems approach uh, where uh, something is replicated, the way we do things is replicated, is typically more effective than an ad hoc approach because we can't explain it to other folks. So as, as the question came earlier, what happens when new people come in? Well, if we've established systems, we can tune them into the system as opposed to anecdotally having to explain to them how we, got, how we do this kind of thing, and, and then every time it changes. Um, expanding community outreach, uh, that's a continual process. I know that continues even, especially perhaps after the store is open, but it goes right through the organizing and feasibility stages, the planning stages, the implementation stages, uh, because that's, your, that's where your success is going to be. The more of the community that's comfortable and wants to participate, the more opportunities your organization will have for success. Beginning capital procurement research. As I said, you could be meeting with bankers and such. You could be um, talking to perhaps you know people in the community that might have um, funds who have been generous in the past about loans and such. You can start looking for perhaps some of the. You know, sometimes in the community, we'll find a lot of people are willing to loan two to five thousand dollars, but there might be two or half a dozen people willing to loan twenty thousand uh, dollars. You might want to start courting those kinds of folks. At least, you know, educating them. It's not, an, it's not inappropriate. And determining your rough sales potential. We want, to, we want to accomplish this during the feasibility stage. And then we, this is a decision point. Have we done this work? Are we comfortable with this work? Are we ready to move forward? Again, there are three decisions to be, uh, one of three possible decisions. One is we've done this work, we're comfortable, we have this knowledge, we're ready to move forward. Two is we've done this work, there are some areas that we feel very weak on, we're not quite sure, so we're not ready to move forward, we're going to work on those areas again. Number three is, we've done this work, we've done it well, and it tells us we probably shouldn't move forward because our chances for success are very limited. These decision points are, are, are excellent times, again, for the organizational group, the organizing group, to sit down and to discuss where we're at and where we're going to go. We look at community development. We want to refine our vision statement during the feasibility stage. Produce a mission statement, a solid one. We want to look at our organizational capacity and what are our potential for fundraising. We want to take a look and get a sense of assess. We want to assess community momentum. That might be by um, how many people are contacting you. That might be by selling memberships. That might be by a list of uh, um, listserv that more and more people are signing up for. I'm not sure how you would measure it in your community. But again, we want to make it to take it take a step back. Look, this is the time. Do we make it we make a decision to move forward or do we not move forward and take one of the other two options? And when we look uh, uh, questions about that. About decision making and moving forward. Mel, nope. What we plan to, what we want to accomplish during the planning stage, we want to have a member equity drive plan. That doesn't mean we're going to have the member equity in. It means we're going to have a plan on how we're going to approach it. Um, what kind of literature is needed? What kind of data do we need? A member equity drive plan. Typically, we need to have some financial information disclosure. What what is needed for a member equity drive plan? And again, I can't stress enough that Bill Gessner has done probably 150 of these, and Bill is very tuned into this, whether it's a, he might be a person that you might want to have just for a few hours on the phone, or you might want to actually ask him to come on in and help you establish a plan. A develop, and I'm not just selling Bill. I've worked with Bill, and this is, you know, I, I just have a ton of respect for how, how well he does with this. And going back to that question earlier in, the, uh, in this webinar about we don't think we can bring in enough money, this is the time when you find out how much money do we, do we really think we can bring in. And a lot of times it's surprising 
what you can do compared to what you think you can do, and a positive nature. We want to make sure that we've developed outside lenses and we've done some initial site exploration. Okay, so then we, again, it's a decision point. Have we done these well? Do we feel comfortable? Are we ready to move on? Um, perhaps we, we try to have developed lender relationships and not, there's nobody that we can find that's interested. We have to raise $400,000. We think we can raise 200000 from our members. No other bank is, is, is ready. Well, we're not ready to move on. We need to take a step back and make sure we have that in our bag before we move on. Then we want to look at supplier feasibility and the market feasibility study. Market feasibility study, again, this is a, a study that will give us our sales potential for this site. And what it does is it just gives us our sales potential. It doesn't guarantee you're going to achieve those sales because the study cannot determine how well or poorly the store is run. And so it says here's what's available. Here's what we, what's available in this community. And there's an assumption that it will be a well-run store according to how the organizing group or annual management has talked to the uh, market feasibility person. Uh, if I, we say there's going to be a bakery and there's going to be a meat counter and there's going to be a deli, and that market feasibility study is done and it says there's potential of $5.5 million worth of sales, and then we move along and say, well, we don't have enough money, we're going to cut out the bakery and we're going to cut out the deli, well, that will greatly impact any market feasibility study, and then you need to go back and have your study updated to include the changes, the significant changes you've made to your store operations. Um, we begin, then we move on, assuming that works, to business plan development. So we want to expand, we want to expand the community outreach during planning stage. We want to, we might want to hire administrative support. Uh, I think some groups actually hire somebody to come in and take minutes or to do some of the data, do some of the chores because many of the people in the organizing group actually have real day jobs that they have to do also beyond, beyond their, um, trying to start up a co-op. But that's a decision for each group to determine. You might want to consider a development project manager. In fact, I think you definitely want to consider it, whether it's an outside person or not. Somebody who is going to work on the whole development of this project. Not necessarily the building of a store, but just the project, the concept of the project. We want to have board, we want to consider, and we should, I think, implement board training. And having an impact as part of that board development or leadership plan. So what do we want to accomplish during all of this process? We want to recruit members. We want to adopt systems. We want to conduct, we want to start bringing in capital, conduct an equity drive. We want to have a development member loan plan, and we might even, might even start that, like I said, if you're working with a couple of, um, a couple of bigger um, players, potentially. We want to assess outside lender requirements. We want to look at design feasibility. We want to begin that process. We want to finalize our business plan. We want, and we want, to, we want to assess our organizational readiness, and we want to take a look at this. Are we ready to move on? If we're not ready to move on, whatever areas we feel we are in need of enhancement, we need to go back and enhance those areas. If we're ready to move on, we're ready to really to, to lay out that member loan plan to, um, to talk with, uh, not just assess outside lenders, but to start securing outside lenders for the whole capital procurement. This is the dollars that's going to take to start up the store and to keep it afloat for the first couple of years because typically cooperative retail stores do not make money for up to two years, some of them longer, some of them shorter, but two years is a safe bet that you won't be making money for the first couple of years. If you've done this all well, your next decision, your next step is implementation, which is the fun stuff. This is what you've been working for the last two years. Questions? Well, let's see. Mel, there are a couple questions, but I just want to check in with you on time. Um, right. Because right. we're at time, and I'll wonder what, uh, how much you want to cover still. Uh, I, I mean, actually, the last slide, which is just general guidelines for success, I don't even... Please note that your conference will expire in 10 minutes. I, I'm comfortable with just answering questions for me, all right? Because I'll just put the last slide up, and everybody has access to that. Yep. So, um, I okay. don't... Okay, good. Okay? Um, let's see. 
just maybe we'll just do one and then and then Marilyn I'll turn it over to you um, the person is is uh, is wondering how they can get businesses keep businesses involved in the startup efforts uh, given that the business is just going to have one membership like any other member got any ideas for that I'm not. I, I, I'm not clear on the question. How to get other businesses involved? Yeah, in other words, they have businesses in their community that you know want right. to be involved in the startup effort, and um, but they've been advised, you know, to just have everybody have an equal type of membership. Is there, you know, it, are are there ways to have businesses, you know, be involved in the startup effort while they just have, you know, a regular membership? Uh, well, you know, in terms of the business and membership, that's probably a legal question, which I'm not, I mean, there might be a way to structure it differently, but um, I'm not quite sure what what we're talking about in terms of being involved. It seems to me that certainly any community-owned um, business, a uh, co-op or a grocery store, should have a lot of support from a lot of other businesses in the community, perhaps everybody other than the local grocery stores, um, because that would enhance um, commerce in your community enhance jobs, but I'm not quite sure of a structure, you know, other than perhaps tapping into the, those business people, maybe the heads of those companies can sit down with you and talk to you about the challenges of running a business. Right. That might be a great little, uh, great little um, uh, kind of uh, group to have, uh, you know, maybe once every month you sit down with three or four business people and just talk about the challenges you're, you're running into in your startup process and they can walk them through it how to help, you know, get ideas for organizing the community effort. Good. Right. And um, so, Marilyn, we're at time. Um, uh, yeah, we sure are. And I want to thank uh, Mel for your presentation today. I very much appreciate it. Thank all the participants for coming. Uh, Mel, there are a few more questions. If you're willing to uh, have people email you those questions, maybe you can give your email address. And um, if not, I guess you'll hang up. But um, uh, you'll be able to take a couple of those questions. A reminder that we have another webinar next week with Debbie Swasuna on market studies. And um, so, Mel, back to you as far as additional questions. Okay. Well, let me give you um, my current email address, which will change soon, but I'll still get emails to it. It's Mel Brave, M E L B as in boy, R A V as in Victor E, Mel Brave at msn.com. You can also reach me at Mel Braverman at cdsfood.coop. Right. That's great. Yeah. Thanks very much, Mel. I appreciate you being willing to, to take any questions that we didn't get answered today. And uh, good luck, everyone, with all your startup efforts, and we hope to see you on another webinar soon. Uh -huh. An evaluation coming shortly.